thankfully, in the last 10 to 15 years, more organizations have been open to exploring how do we balance, how do we identify and attract and support the right people who have already existing technical competence or have demonstrated a willingness to learn and acquire technical competence? How do we get those people to balance getting a job done with enabling others, engaging others, and supporting others to actually do it with them? Just like failure, success is rarely achieved alone. It's down to groups, it's down to teams. And this morning we're going to be exploring the softer side. Sorry guys, we are going to be talking about emotions. But stick with it, because when you partner technical competence with emotional intelligence, the transition can be fantastic. We've got lots of case studies, won't share with you today. Uh, but I was with uh, your colleagues in uh, 2004 at REF Cosford. 2004, they were exploring how to use emotional intelligence in a coaching environment to equip, enable, and support people to do an even better job and enjoy the journey. What can sometimes happen, especially during turbulent times or stressful times, is there's so much focus on getting the task completed that enabling people to actually develop that clarity, get that engagement, and understand that they've been collaborated with rather than just managed can go, go missing. Not intentionally, but the manager is often thinking, I've been assessed on getting this job done, and it will be done at any cost, rather than if I collaborate with my team right at the outset, and we get that shared understanding, we get that clarity of what's required, why it's required, and what excellent looks like, we can save headaches and heartaches along the way. Now, when everything's going wonderfully well, and life is a breeze, anyone can manage. Anyone can manage, even without technical competence, if that person knows where to go to get that technical competence and safeguard what they're doing. It shouldn't be the default setting for a manager. But what about when there's turbulence? What about when there's a looming deadline? What about when someone more senior doesn't just ask you to do something, but commands you to do something, and we all jump? Ever heard of the term firefighting? Yeah? What about if we took a moment to understand how the fires have been started and who is actually starting them? We've worked with organisations from construction uh, through to NHS that when they take a moment to think, bear in mind, your brain has between 40 and 60,000 thoughts a day. Thank you. Uh, 40 to 60,000 thoughts a day. From those 40 to 60,000 thoughts, three to 600 decisions will be made. From those decisions, as well as being influenced by facts and data, your beliefs, your values and experience will also influence them. The thing about emotional intelligence is it doesn't replace technical competence, it partners it. This is the thing. Negative people aren't usually negative people because they think, I'm going to be negative today, I'm going to be awkward. It's not, is my glass half full or half empty? Where the hell's my glass gone? It's not about that. It's how do we get people from diverse backgrounds with different experiences, different expertise, and different desires and goals to work together collaboratively so you meet more like that than that. Because there is a, a, a saying that, well, I have to work with them, so I'll just tolerate. I invite you to consider using intolerance rather than tolerance. And not against anyone, but with yourselves. Because if there's a relationship that's not working, it's your responsibility. You're in it. There's a responsibility to make a, you know, make a deposit in the emotional bank account. When people are trusted, when they get on with what they're doing, if they say, OK, boss, sir, ma'am, I'll deliver that, and then they know they can't, but they just complied with the instruction or request, when there's a high-trust relationship based on emotional intelligence and that bedside manner that is so often missing, even in the medical uh, arena, someone will come to you and say, I shouldn't have said I could do that, I really can't. They'll only come and do that if they know that they're not going to be reprimanded, attacked, or undermined, or being seen as disloyal. Ever had that? Ever accepted a crazy deadline you knew you couldn't meet? <coughs> I invite you to find a way, using language and also emotional intelligence in terms of standards, to ask a question of, could you help me understand why this is important and why it's more important than this and needs to be done now, just so I can do my best for you? That's a very different way. You're not abdicating responsibility. You're asking for clarity. And when you're asking someone else for clarity, their brain engages with you, as in, you actually care. 
Isn't that a little bit different in some situations? Because all eyes are on the boss. You set the emotional climate for the people around you, especially your team and direct reports. <coughs> Communication is, we communicate with people how we want to communicate. And there's this saying that treat other people as you would want them to treat you. That's complete twaddle. Just because I want to be treated in a certain way doesn't mean you do, does it? But it's a generalization that's been accepted as a management norm and it's complete twaddle. But how about treating people how they wish to be treated? And this is finding out right at the very outset, if you can, whether it be a new recruit, new member of your team, just so I can understand. How do you think we could work best together? Now, if they don't know you, and it may be because of rank or position or standing in the organization or your team, they may go, I don't know, and just go quiet, the silence will happen, and they'll wait for you to fill the, the silence. How about saying, well, OK, if you don't know, Let's meet in an hour. Just give me two things that you really value in a manager. And I trust you'll be open and honest. They've got an hour for their brain to start understanding that you're asking for the right intentions. You're making a safe environment when speaking truth to power and collaboration is the norm. I've worked with managers who were technically brilliant and they were fa the fantastic people. But bedside manner? Oh, no. Didn't get it. And this is about setting permissions in relationships right at the very outset. How can we work best together to achieve what the team, the group, the organisation trusts, pays and expects us to deliver?